British mountain guides Martin Moran and Simon Jenkins are training for a formidable task. In their home mountains of Western Scotland, they are preparing for the journey of a lifetime, one which will call for all their experience and skill as climbers. Back to Scotland in June. In just two weeks, they will be leaving the hills of Scotland for the icy challenge of the highest the alpine today. peaks. Yeah. What kind of weather are you, you going to be expecting in the Alps? Well, it's not going to be quite like this, sort of a, a dreary Scottish day. It's, it's going to be the harsh realities, hopefully, of bright sunshine and cold, clear skies at night. With stable weather, they expect to take between 50 and 60 days to climb the 75 peaks which are spread across the borders of Switzerland, France and Italy. Over six months, they planned their route and scheduled a major backup operation from teams of support climbers. Right, yeah. I was just wondering if you got this support brief and the schedule I sent you for the two weeks... Martin and Simon it. recruited several teams of experienced yeah, climbing friends. Had a look through it. They each had to be willing to devote up to a week of their holiday to the expedition. Right, you've done the Matterhorn before, of course, yeah. Since the middle of the 19th century, the Alps have been the playground of Europe for mountaineers. It is a vast range, stretching from Slovenia to the foothills of Provence. And the conquest of its 75 4,000 metre peaks spanned 140 years, from 1786 to 1925. The first man to climb them all was the Austrian optician, Dr. Karl Blodig, who completed them in 1932, at the remarkable age of 73. Wildest and most remote of all the 4,000 meter ranges is the Bernese Oberland. Early in their journey, Martin and Simon embarked on an eight-day traverse of its ten peaks. After a six-hour night climb, they reached the final summit, the Alichorn, at dawn on July 1st, and viewed the coming challenge of the Pennine Alps. The weather was magnificent, and at this stage they were only one day behind their most optimistic schedule. What a morning! It's superb, isn't it? All the omens were good for their longest stage, the 37 summits of the Pennine Alps. What are you looking at over there, Martin? That's Monte Rosa. <laughs> at 4,634 metres, Mont Rosa is the second highest peak of the Alps. They would spend the next 15 days climbing at altitudes continually in excess of 10,000 feet. The Weissmies hut above the Saas Valley gave a perfect view of the first half of the Traverse. The, the chain of mountains behind is generally known as the Michabal chain. We'll be going up on Thursday night to the Michabal hut, which is a hut very much like this nice comfortable hut we're staying at tonight. But after that, when we go up onto the summit ridge of the Michabal on Friday, we're on our own, basically bivouacking camping are using very basic bivouac shelters for the next week and some of the ridges along the Michabel chain particularly the Nadelgrat and the Domgrat are very sensational and very interesting technically and there's a very large concentration of peaks up there we'll be getting two three and even four four thousand meter peaks done each day if the weather allows through a snowy call on the right hand side of the main ridge there we can see our first peak, which is the Jurenhorn, coming across and up a more snowy, snowier peak, is the Hoberg. On from that, a small top, the Steck Nadelhorn, and then a really prominent point, which is the Nadelhorn itself, with a, a linking ridge, the Nadelgrat, to a, a very clean, snow-faced mountain, the Lenspitz. Drop back down. Three support teams would be sustaining this big push. At a final briefing, the climbers schedule their movements and plan daily communication using lightweight radio transceivers. If we don't make contact, we'll try again at eight. 
we don't make contact at eight, then we'll just leave it till... Two days into the traverse, the fine weather caved in without warning. At the Mishabel Yoch, we tried to get radio contact with the climbers, but the only noise we heard were distant shouts being blown about in the wind. You can't tell if it's English or not. <laughs> what language that is? From the bivvy hut, we saw a lone figure struggling through the deep snow towards us. The storm had come in during the night and it was still raging at midday. As it got closer, we recognised the figure. It turned out to be Bruce Taylor, carrying supplies for Simon and Martin. We got in tow with this bumper in that route we were doing yesterday. Got soloing. You crossed the route a few times and whatnot. Uh huh. Because they ended up, we had to kind of more or less escort them up. And then turn An exhausted the Roger Coppock staggered in a wee while later. They'd spent the night in a snow hole on the summit of the Alp Hubble. Bruce talked about the lightning storm that had pinned them down on the top. It was just buzzing, you know that. Yeah. And every time you go to pick your gear up, well, eventually you grabbed a rucksack and the axes and crampons. Yeah. I bloody left my bivvy back, didn't I? <laughs> my dust bag is so good. I'm hoping this place here is going to be a bit more comfortable. It's aye, it's good. A couple it's of blankets. Got, aye. Aye, I'll get stripped blankets down and get dried then. Okay. Absolutely so good. As the winds raged on, there was no sign of Simon and Martin. And we were all getting a wee bit worried. Any word from them? Like that. Too early. Are you at the middle of that, Yes. We are at the door of that. Repeat. We plan to climb the Teshorn and come to the Bivouac hut tomorrow night. So we need food and fuel there tomorrow night. Over. Food and fuel is there. Over. Are you descending tomorrow? Depends on the weather. That night the weather got worse. It snowed six inches even down at the Dom hut and we had no choice but to retreat to the valley. Next morning, Bruce and Roger were determined to get back their abandoned gear. So it was up and over the Alp Hubble again. getting pretty hairy. It was like a wild day out in a Scottish winter. North, north ridge of the Alp Hubel, heading up. Up to the summit, get all the bivvy gear back and then heading back down onto the glacier. Hopefully into a bit of shelter on the far side.
As we got to the summit, it cleared for a bit. The support team got their gear back. But it was still a long, dodgy way down. On the lee slopes, the avalanche conditions were extreme. By mid-afternoon, the four support climbers got off the tops and descended to the warmth and fertility of the Matter Valley. Their aim had been achieved. The Mishabeljok hut was stocked with three days of food supplies. But Martin and Simon were also back in the valley. They had lost two days on their schedule and now needed to re-climb 8,000 feet to reach the hut. For all its danger, the support climb had produced its rewards. That's quartz. Yeah. No, that, that one there's not bad. Where'd you get that? Oh, on the, the campsites, the climbers would swap experiences and enjoy a brief reunion with their wives, who had not expected to see them for over a week. We managed to prize a few sort of good reunions off. Uh -huh. I was bending a 60 quid ice axe trying to, you know, trying to get the thing off, so... Luckily, the first 2,000 feet of the climb could be done on their bikes. Heading up these zigzags from Tash, sucking in the cold air into the lungs. We're trying to get a heat going so the muscles are working. Quite a desperate series of zigzags this. I wasn't particularly enjoying it. I think Martin was feeling less of a bit of a competition here, but... I'm pretty wiped out. I really shouldn't have gone so fast. Stomach's tight. And I think Simon felt that I was just pushing the pace just a bit too much. But it certainly made me feel better just to get up to Teshal, a third of the climb done, and was able to start focusing my mind on what lay ahead rather than what I was leaving behind. Exhausted, they dismounted at the high meadow of Teshal. Already it was snowing gently, a portent of more bad weather on the tops. God, torture, eh? Yeah. I was taking it easy. <laughs> Before continuing, the climbers needed to change into a dry set of clothes and regain circulation in their cold, cramped feet. back to life. Simon was using double layer plastic boots for the climbing. If we've got a lot of snow and ice climbing, we'd use plastic boots because they give you better support for ice climbing, but on the Zermatt section, it's mainly mixed and rock ridges, so the leathers do slightly better. I might suffer a bit more from cold feet than Simon. Here we are, so you do some zigzags, cut through the cliff. Three, two, two, three. Good map reading was essential. They were likely to meet whiteout conditions up on the glaciers. There you go. Oh, that's a bit lighter than me. <coughs> right. Yeah, okay. We're heading here for the Michebel Beauvoir cut, and our only safe option onto the Tarshorn. The ridge rises steeply, though fairly safely, onto the summit there. Crenellated snow at and this point a lot of fresh snow creating rather large cornices, unstable on one side. While the climbers traversed the Teshorn and Alpubal, the support team slogged up the Alalinyok to set up a new camp. No. Yeah. Despite suffering from the altitude, they were in good spirits. <laughs> it must be the altitude. <laughs> the camp would be sighted at nearly 12,000 feet, and they carried loads of over 50 pounds each. The tents were pitched on the deserted and wholly exposed pass. Guy lines were secured with ice axes, and snow piled on the tent valances for added stability. Well, what you do, what you do, gather this lot together. 
There were now several hours to wait and try to relax before Martin and Simon arrived. Behind them, the Matterhorn loomed across the Zermatt Valley. It was a magnificently deserted spot, a place just to sit and savour the views. But there were tasks at hand. Melting snow for water, brewing and feeding themselves occupied much of the evening. Why the knife, Roger? Why the knife? Because uh, too used to uh, convenience dried foods, you see, and you get some real good, uh, honest to goodness, tinned food, and you can't get into it. Mission accomplished successfully. Right. The weather had been fine, but clouds were beginning to mass in the western sky. It could be. Uh, seeing us beating a rapid retreat off this mountain as well tomorrow morning. <coughs> it takes a two litre pan full of snow to melt enough water for one mug of tea. At 8.30 we arrived at the support camp. We'd been going for 15 hours and we were really ravenous. There's no more time than to just cook a quick meal and get our heads down for a few hours sleep so we could make some progress next morning. But when we woke up at 4 a.m., we could hear the spin drift beating against the tent and we knew that another storm had blown up. Four of the support team broke their camp and prepared to descend. Martin Welch and Graham Forshaw would remain to support the climbers. Packing up the frozen gear in the storm took over an hour. The nylon dome tents had withstood the storm well, but it now took four climbers to hold the tent down in the gusting wind while it was being packed. As they watched the team preparing to leave, Martin and Simon had to accept that they would lose yet another day on their schedule. We should have been doing three peaks that day, but instead all we could manage was an ascent of the Alalin Horn, which was right above the camp. It was plastered in snow, the drifts were really all but impossible to break through to get to the summit. It's desperate snow conditions and to keep going here, you've really got to have a bit of a will to, to see this thing through. This is a short day, only climbing the Alalinhorn, yet we've probably, by this point, already burnt up the calories that we took on board last night. Even the simplest summits were taking their toll. The Alalinhorn should have been an hour's easy climb, but today it took three. They returned to the one remaining tent in the early afternoon. In this isolated position in such awful weather, we could be equally in the Antarctic or the Himalayas, cocooned in the, in the skin of the tent, uh, keeping the diaries up to date. Next morning, we had to move. We had to get over the Rimfish Horn and the Stralhorn and get to our next support camp below Monte Rosa. And it was really make or break. We had no more food, no more fuel. If we didn't get there today, then we really were going to have to retreat to the valley again. The atmosphere is becoming increasingly tense. We're now four days behind schedule. We thought it was a 
better morning. <laughs> Cheers for a few minutes. More of the same, deep snow, navigating by compass in virtual whiteout conditions. We knew that when we got back to the call, the camp would be gone. Two days later, they were camped on the Mont Rosa Glacier with a wide vista of the Zermatt peaks. From Monte Rosa, the second highest of our peaks to Liscam, the snow crested arete between its two summits, onto the snow domes of Castor and Pollux, relatively straightforward and following on steeply onto the Brighthorn and its crenellated arete, where unexpectedly we were caught out by lightning on the second summit and had to retreat over into the, onto the Italian side. Um, for safety's sake. The scenery around Monte Rosa is almost Himalayan in its scale. The northeast face of Liscam is one of the most impressive snow ice faces in the Alps. It's now got over eight routes on it. The first of these was climbed as long ago as 1911. And the summit ridge at the top is one of the most famous snow traverses famous for its double cornices, that means a cornice on each side of the ridge. We just hope we will get clear conditions for that traverse. Nearing the top of the Liscam, the weather really began to improve. And for the first time in a week, we felt marvelously optimistic about getting right across the Brighthorn today. And of course, just to be here on one of the mountains, I'd most wanted to climb in the Alps was tremendous. And the ridge was just every bit as good as we had imagined it. So we made a radio call down to Joy and Carol to tell them that we'd be at the Schwarzsee below the Matterhorn that afternoon. We got some food inside us and headed off after five minutes rest. We still had another seven hours of climbing if we were going to make it to the Brighthorn. The ridge was just marvellous, a beautiful snow arete, technically easy, but poised in a magnificent position. It took us just 35 minutes to traverse to the western summit of Liscam. We had absolutely no idea that we were going to be hit by another thunderstorm in just three hours' time when we were up on the Brighthorn. As the thunderstorm broke, the support team of Martin Stone and Mike Walford were returning exhausted to Zermatt. The long slopes of the Gorner Glacier seemed interminable. Even these two top-class fell runners were feeling the strain. What have you done today? Walked down about six glaciers. <laughs> Anyway, we had a grand day on Liscam, didn't we? Is it such a long way back down? I just feel that there is nothing in the tent. Well, it's hardly surprising. <coughs> I know I need a wash. After seven days on snow and ice, arriving at the Schwarzsee was just wonderful. The place seemed like pure paradise. Meeting up with the support teams here at Schwarzsee below the Matterhorn, we get a chance to talk through the next few days. Right, what else did we want to check? We know where we want to put the gear. Radio at one, two, five and six. Yeah. We've got some camps we need to plan have a look at the maps. Because this is all just completely So if you're looking at the campsite, that shows that as ground rather than rock on, on a flat ledge. Yeah, yeah just that would be ideal. 6,000 feet above towered the Matterhorn. At dawn next day, they climbed through the mists to an unearthly mountain paradise. The rocks of the Hornley Ridge were covered in snow and ice, and the mountain was empty.
The angle was easy, but in the snow, every step needed care. With clear skies above, they began to enjoy the climbing again. In places, the rocks were veneered with their glass, the transparent skin of ice so feared by climbers. At the tiny Solvay hut, 1,500 feet below the summit, they stopped to put on crampons and take a short rest. I think the great thing about the Matterhorn is it's symbolic that it's the 40th peak, and I think it's just over the halfway mark on Stravers. Right, yeah. So we can start thinking a bit more optimistically now about finishing in say 55 days schedule if the weather stays stable now so life is a lot more rosier than it was a few days ago when we were sinking into knee-deep snow and peering into blizzards and whiteouts steepness of the climbing here focuses the mind. And the, the only thing that's really adding a deal of security is, is the fixed rope here and certainly not taking anything away from the exposure down the north face and it's, it's great not to have a, a huge bunch of people about you when you're, when you're climbing something like this. We're now on the steepest, most exposed part of the climb Well, there's great big fixed ropes, thick enough to tow a barge with. This is the approximate place where Wimper's party had their accident on the first ascent back in 1865. As I try to climb this without using the fixed ropes, I'm just so impressed how difficult delicate it is and how they dared to do it, nor am I so surprised that they had an accident on the descent. Right. In fine dry weather there might be upward of 50 climbers battling their way up the fixed ropes on the steep final buttress. This is also where it gets really congested when there's 50 or 100 people trying to climb. People going up, there's people coming down. It's a good feeling to get up here anyway. I'm not treading knee deep in snow, it's every step counted. Yeah, it must be one of the best summits in the Alps. worrying about the descent which is going to be long and quite difficult in places reversing all that sloppy snow and icy ground. <coughs> so I think if we leave 10 minutes we should be down to only about three, half three if we really mm. cool. 9,000 feet below the summit the tourists were taking their pleasure. The Matterhorn has made Zermatt but the resort is now a world apart from the mountain reality. After the Matterhorn, we had four days of settled weather, each day climbing one of the giant peaks on the west side of the Zermatt Valley. We did the Dom Blanche, then the Obergabelhorn. And traversing the Skyline Ridge round to the Zenal Rothorn. And from the Zenal Rothorn, we had quite a, a difficult 
and intricate routes across intervening peaks like the Shallyhorn, which aren't even 4,000 meters, and finally the magnificent Weisshorn descending its north ridge, and over a final easy summit, the Bisshorn, and then down to Zinal. The climbing was fantastic. We were climbing 12 hours a day on five hours sleep. The mountains were deserted. The clouds were often below us. It was one of the most enjoyable parts of the expedition. On July 26, the two men came down to the valley, elated to have finished La Grande Courant, the great crown of peaks which ring Zermatt. That had uh, 22 hours out of 30 sleeping yesterday and overnight. <laughs> that shows how knackered we were when we got to that Billy hut. I mean, we just slept all yesterday, didn't we? Just seemed like hibernate, didn't we? Yeah. And then back to sleep again at half eight. Yeah. There's nothing to do, nothing, nothing to, to eat. eat. <laughs> so, uh, is it of uh, sleep? <laughs> I feel much better for it. Yes. Good hut shoes, these. It's good, exciting conditions, what do you call it? Alright, I'm gonna head. Yeah. Back at camp, they enthused about the traverse of the Weisshorn. The, well, the crenellated rat is amazing. Uh, it goes on and on, and abs, abs, and snow, snow, erect on top of blocks, sort of slanting blocks, and everything. After a night in Zinal, the climbers would cycle towards the Mont Blanc massif, and for once, Martin's children could join in the proceedings. Tartan Ted. Tartan Ted. That's what he is. What does he do? He helps Dad on the mountains. We now had the chance to make up some time. The weather was looking settled. If we could cycle 130 kilometers and do the Grand Combat in two days, we would pick up a couple of days on our schedule. Men cycling down the Rhone Valley, and for the first time in three weeks, we're going to meet a lot of traffic. At Martigny, they stopped for food. While on the road, Martin and Simon took every opportunity to enjoy some fresh local produce. See this? Yeah. <laughs> I need some cream on my lips. <laughs> Are they all cracking? <laughs> yeah. A ton of Vaseline might help me go down. Mm. At just 1600 feet above sea level, Matigny was the lowest point of the entire journey. They now had to climb Switzerland's highest and busiest major road pass, the Grand St. Bernard. It's a busy road. It's hard to believe it. Three hours ago, I just sort of fell off the bike at Borg St. Pierre, absolutely knackered. When you get an evening like this, it sort of inspires you to recover and keep going. Absolutely gorgeous. Nice to be here, yeah. Get inside where it's warm, I think. The Grand Combin was the final mountain that they would climb in Switzerland.
I have to pack breakfast, lunch and the main meal and anything and everything that's going to be eaten in between. In the diet at base camp have been pulses, ground nuts, plenty of fresh vegetables, cans of tuna, a uh, few tins of tomatoes and things but trying to keep away from the tins because they're heavy. Plenty of fresh fruit. The pulses would be processed into goulashes, nut roast, quiches and then we have all the dairy products. Oat cakes are very good as a staple diet again can be eaten with cheese, honey just as a, as a pudding. Um, tea, trail mix and throughout the trip his diet has been supplemented with evening primrose oil and a multivitamin. Chocolate, plenty of chocolate goes in. Muesli, anything that's high energy but the, the problem is because the, it's difficult to carry up we have to try and give a little bit of uh, difference in, in the food as well so that they'll actually want to eat it so provide a little bit of variety which is why things like peanut butter and um, honey we'll give them spices oxo cubes just to make the food a little bit more flavorsome I think it's a nightmare, those oh, wow. at La Fouille the climbers rest for a day and soak up the sun before tackling the Mont Blanc range spirits are high <laughs> Kvirkel Refuge at about 2,700 metres has probably one of the best views in the Mont Blanc range and sitting down for a few hours we got a chance to catch up with the diaries. Important to keep them up to date before the, the memory fades. It's very hard to keep a handle on the statistics and, and the facts which are going past so quickly. Our plan was to get up from our beds at six o'clock in the evening, have a meal and start climbing. We're going to climb right through the night to do Les Droites and the Aiguille Verte. Climbing at night is, mm -hmm. feels very intimidating. The night vision will never come back. Mm -hmm. It's always an extra tension. We were looking forward to dawn. It was only two hours now until first light. <coughs> Getting our helmets on because there's a big stonefall danger in any of these ice couloirs. Snow is crisp and firm, well frozen during the night hours, and making it safe and relatively easy to climb. Good deal of climbing to go still onto the Aiguille de Jardin and the Aiguille Vert. Um, the prospect of getting those two done today really starts to fire you up a little bit. In the hours before dawn, my stomach was feeling pretty bad. Maybe some of the tension from the previous day's climbing. And uh, I was sick at this point. It's just this magnificent morning. And there was poor Simon feeling absolutely wretched at that point. But we're there right on time at seven o'clock in the morning. We now had two hours to traverse the ridge to the Aiguille Verte and then get back to the hut before the sun became too hot and the snow became dangerous. To get to the Vert, we had to cross the Col Armand Chalet, which is a magnificent wafer-thin slice of snow. And just moving together on crusty, cruddy snow with ice underneath, with a 3,000 foot drop beneath you and no means of protection between us. We just had to be steady. If one of us slipped, then we'd both be off. Not all of the Mont Blanc range is so peaceful. To gain access to the mountains, support teams are using the Aiguille de Midi cable car one of the most popular tourist attractions in the Alps, 
and the starting point for thousands of climbers every summer. Five miles away, Martin and Simon were moving alone to their next major peak. Next day we faced the Grand Jiras. It's an incomparable mountain. We had to follow its west ridge on the right-hand skyline, there and back to the summit. We ended up having a 19-hour day the ridge is sensational and totally inescapable. 12 hours of climbing up and down. We arrived back at the call at the hut at 11.30 at night. The following day we traversed along the Rochefort Arete, which is one of the most beautiful snow ridges in the Alps and a very popular climb. It led us along rightwards to the Dent de Géant, a 180 metre rock pinnacle which marked the end of the Rochefort Ridge. The Dons is a very popular climb and it's fixed with ropes, just like the Matterhorn. It's a very steep granite, beautiful quality of rock. A lot of people climbing around us, but because the weather's beginning to threaten, cloud in with light snow showers, everyone is actually retreating at this point. The climbing would be grade four and grade five if the ropes weren't there to pull on when you needed. We had a lovely time on it ourselves. When the thunder started rumbling, I just cowered on the stance, feeling truly terrified. I had no choice, we were so near the top, we just had to go for it and try and get off before the lightning struck. This is the quickest way. So Simon just grabbed the fixed ropes and pulled himself up as quick as he could. I had no choice but just to follow him. Everybody else was getting off as quick as possible. A hailstorm came, I was just waiting for the first strike of lightning. Climbing! And we were on probably the best lightning conductor in the whole Mont Blanc range. Top, miraculously the storm clouds were clearing and I've never breathed a bigger sigh of relief in my whole life. So we were able to take things a little bit more in a more controlled manner from there on and working out the abseils to get back down. Only one big peak left and that was Mont Blanc with 11 summits to do but that was our last major challenge and if we could crack that then we knew we were going to succeed in climbing all the 4,000 meter peaks. The first four summits of the Mont Blanc range lay on the Diable Ridge, the Devil's Ridge. After two days sitting in the tent we were just delighted to get moving. Knowing that we still had 30, 36 hours of climbing ahead of us non-stop. But we just reveled in the exposure and the enjoyment of free climbing in 
one of the most wonderful places in the Mont Blanc range. On such steep ground, you might expect the tension to be heightened and uh, the, the hands to be trembling, but this is solid rock. The belays are all there and it's just enjoyable free climbing. This being my second traverse of the ridge, it's just a delight uh, to get on some solid Chamonix granite and uh, feel the, the fingers burning on the roughness of the, of the crystals. The Diablo Ret was first traversed by Armand Charlet, the great French guide, back in 1928. He climbed it all free use no pitons or artificial aids to climb these pinnacles. It really was a high point in pre-war rock climbing, this first traverse. The Diablo Ridge gave the hardest rock climbing of the expedition, with sustained pitches of grade four and five. This equates to a very severe on the British scale of grades and seems a lot harder wearing stiff mountain boots and carrying a sack. The route is a hidden gem known to few and savoured by those lucky enough to find it. When the pioneering alpinist and poet Geoffrey Winthrop Young penned the line, pitted as giants with rock-bound crest, he might well have had the Diablo pinnacles at the back of his mind. From the pinnacles, the two men scrambled up a loose rock ridge and crossed Mont Blanc de Tacou to reach a tiny support tent on the Col Maudit. They were nine hours into their marathon and they had another 30 before the next storms were due. How was it? It's okay, it's in good nick, you know, yeah. but... Uh... I was just having to leave so late because of the poor weather last night. I trusted David was going to arrive. What was the wind? We reckoned the cable car might be closed. It's superb. I mean, the rock's first class, you know, and the, the rat points are all there. Marlon loops and rings on the, on the abtat so it doesn't wear out. Really well thought out. Yeah improves the spirits because we were pretty depressed this morning <laughs> having sat for two days suffered the storm last night and then it was still windy at dawn and we just couldn't set off so to actually get going and get onto a route of real quality is just tremendous mind you we've got a fair way to go another 16 hours probably of effort yeah non-stop from here to get all the tops on Mont Blanc done Seven o'clock, we arrived at our support camp on Col Modi, where we could recover and have a meal before setting off over Mont Blanc by moonlight. The evening was wonderfully clear, and a blood-red sunset developed over the foothills of Aravis. As soon as the sun dropped, the temperature plummeted well below zero. For the next eight hours, they would stride over the eternal snows of Western Europe's highest mountain. Four o'clock. At dawn, they joined the stream of climbers on the final ridge of Mont Blanc. Every fine day in summer, some 200 people will make the ascent of the easiest route to the summit. We've been going for 21 hours, pretty much non-stop. Uh, I've got probably another 12 or so to go before we complete the satellites in Mont Blanc. 
hopefully before any bad weather comes in that was forecast yesterday uh, or before we <laughs> find that we can't go any further through exhaustion. All we've got to worry about is this difficult descent which takes us over three more tops and uh, the final descent to the valley either late this evening or tomorrow. For Martin and Simon, this was perhaps the loneliest moment of their journey, leaving the happy throngs to descend the difficult and dangerous Buiar Ridge. As the sun rose higher, the snow would turn to mush. It was a race against time that they knew they couldn't win. Thirty hours later, they descended, exhausted but victorious, to the green pastures of the Val Vigny. Really tough. Just lack of sleep, it was just, and mental tension. When we got to the Eccles last night, we were both, like, by mid-afternoon, we were both, like, sort of, mentally shell-shocked, I suppose, you could say. And then we had those two tops to do, Montbrouillard and Ponte Beretti, which are just totally loose. It was, all, it was all right, it was just a case, you know, being really tired and not, not being able to afford to slip. I was aware of what was going on, but you still weren't 100% compass mentors. You're not mentally as sure, perhaps, as you, you would be. Is it a massive relief, Martin, to, to be off that stuff? It is. I mean, we were really thinking yesterday, God. Who got just to get you and you what? This morning was good, though. It was the Aguil Blanche was lovely. It was good snow. It didn't take us long. This is great to get down here, relief. As the two men rested and nursed their swollen feet, their wives could at last anticipate an end to it all. Having spent the majority of the last 52 days with Martin rather than Carol, it's not much of a honeymoon for her, I'm sure. It's like a, a, just a, a game of waiting where you go from stop to stop to stop, waiting for the next instruction, waiting for the next move. Uh, we've had some time to ourselves, but not a lot, and I must admit I'll be quite glad to get home. How does it feel? It's time in the morning, it's okay. The biggest pass of all, the 2,642 metre Col de Galibier, would take the climbers to the base of their final peak, the Bar des Écrans. This pass echoes with memories of great Tour de France names, painted on the tarmac at intervals along its length. It was wrong to imagine that days like the Galibier were easy. In the whole trip, there had been only three days when the two of them had been able to rest completely. On this last occasion, Joy and Martin's children followed them all the way up the 6,000-foot climb. Over the weeks, Simon had been steadily losing weight. Martin reflected on his present feelings. Mentally, we were getting very tired. It was something we were just really pleased to get over now. Two days left, one more mountain to climb. Reaching the summit of the Col de Galibier was one of the high points of the whole journey. It was as good as any of the 4,000 meter mountains we climbed. We could see the Bardes Ekran from the top and truly now believe that it was coming to an end. That's it, we cracked it. Brilliant. The downhill rush, after negotiating the snaking hairpins, would take them to the Col du Lettre, start point for the final push. Time here, albeit brief, to view the magnificent panorama. By the tall whispering grasses, the two men relaxed. Despite the close-knit nature of their teamwork, the strain of almost two months' continuous effort had stretched the two men. In the evening, they packed their sacks for the last time and set off towards the Ecran. Start on the 100. Yeah, the 
After 52 days, 1,070 kilometers of overland travel and 71,000 meters of climbing, their odyssey was nearly over. For most of the trip, they had had the mountains to themselves, feeling like pioneers with so much freedom. They had wanted to keep with the spirit of classical alpine climbing, traveling fast and light over high mountain country, wholly dependent on their own personal skill and judgment. This they had achieved. After passing the 50 peaks mark, Martin admitted he was counting peaks. Focusing and taking one peak at a time had proved singularly difficult. Now the barriers were down. Even these crowded approaches would not be able to mar the anticipation of their final summit. There's a runner there, Dave. On this last climb, they were joined by David Litherland, a guiding client and their mentor in the Alps 4000 project. The two men had gained much of the experience needed to do this traverse through guiding David on 4000 meter peaks. His presence reminded Simon and Martin that for many climbers, they were a magnificent lifetime challenge. It wasn't until they had left the crowds behind that Martin Moran and Simon Jenkins could truly appreciate that this was really the end. Wow, brilliant! Small world, isn't it? <laughs> this is Dave. Hey. Well done, Martin, Simon. This one. After their epic journey, Simon and Martin were still able to demonstrate a depth of feeling for their chosen way of life. To quote, the enthusiasm is still there for the mountains. The mountains are our life. Without them, we would be nothing, and our lives would be so much diminished. Okay. Yep. Go keep it down. Go keep it down. What? What? <laughs> 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 You're joking. <laughs> Come here, Martin. How did he go today, Martin? How, how are you feeling? I'm pretty knackered. Not exhausted. <laughs> Ready for the next day. That one there. That's got the symbol. Yeah, that's the. Uh, but it's just the. On off switch on the camera to on. Well, it's under here, is it? How do you move this up? Does it click? Okay, well, that says then, isn't it? Really? And then you're. Is it red is on. Is it a whole. Yeah. Red, red is. Money. Red should be play, yeah. Oh.